Hello, and welcome to another edition of Bill and Kip's Excellent Bible Adventure. Uh, we're continuing our way through the Gospel of John, and we're continuing to move forward as we look at all the, the different uh, characters that come to life through this amazing Gospel. I'm Bill Brunson, the senior pastor here at Vestavia Hills United Methodist Church, and as always, I'm joined by Kit McClure. And I'm the executive pastor here at Vestavia Hills, and we're glad that you're with us today. Well, uh, we have a very unique object sitting on, on, on here, and um, it's ivory soap. Since 1879. I, 1879, and uh, it is, uh, I, to, to be faithful to our rule... I purchased this out of my own funds, and I'm going to give it to our food pantry. Oh, excellent. excellent. So it's just passing through. Keeps the budget down. Budget's down. We haven't really spent any money. And we'll kind of share a little bit more about why we have Ivory Soap sitting here later. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to, you know, I didn't want anybody to be surprised mm -hmm. that uh, that is there. Because so. currently we look like one of the old TV shows where <laughs> today we're sponsored by, yeah. and we're not sponsored by yeah. Ivory Soap. Yeah, they not, probably would be very offended if they knew that we're using it. They might call this a soap opera, but... <laughs> they <laughs> could. <laughs> Especially <laughs> today's story. That's it exactly, could be a soap absolutely. opera. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, today we're looking at the Samaritan woman, and uh, it takes up really all of chapter 4 of John, and uh, it takes place in the, the region of Samaria, so uh, why don't you share a little bit with us about, about that region and a little history there. All right. Yeah, the region of Samaria is, it is south of the Galilee, but north of Jerusalem. And it is a, basically a pocket of people that live inside the bounds of Israel uh, that still do. They still live there. And in the time of Jesus, their region that they lived in ran from the Jordan River all the way over uh, almost, well, it, it touched the Mediterranean Sea, um, and, and so it was a very large space of land. Uh, they had been there for centuries uh, when the Israelites were taken off into the Babylonian captivity uh, back around 721 B.C. Not all of the Israelites went to Babylon, mm -hmm. and Assyrians came and lived in Israel. And that was kind of a typical strategy of divide and conquer basically that's right you take you take the group you want away and then you move people in to take their place like with daniel they took out all the bright people who could start a revolution yep took them to uh to babylon and then they sent other folks there uh, back to israel so. right and so you ended up with the assyrians and the 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 remnant left in israel uh well intermarrying and so you end up when uh, Jerusalem is basically laid waste. Uh, the temple is destroyed. You remember part of the return was to go back and rebuild the walls of the temple. Well, the temple's down in Jerusalem. And so in Samaria, the, the faithful there determined that they would worship there. They would worship on Mount Gerizim. And because in this region, there were sacred things and sacred places. Uh, that was that were part of the the Jewish people's history and and their faith story, and so over the time when the Israelites came back to Israel and they reestablished their their uh, their country, well, Samaria was still there, and they refused to change. They refused to go back to Jerusalem even when the temple was built back on Temple Mount. They refused to change their ways, and they refused to say that there was anything wrong with the fact that they had intermarried with the Assyrians. And so it became this cultural issue that by the time of Jesus, people would actually cross the Jordan River and go down the, the other side and then recross the Jordan River not to set foot in Samaria. And if you set foot in Samaria, then you were supposed to always dust your feet off to get the Samaritan dust off of your feet. And they even had a saying that it was better to eat the flesh of a pig than it was to eat bread in a, baked in a Samaritan oven. So, I mean, these people who, ate, who, who lived by the kosher food laws and never ate pork said it was better to eat pork 
than it was to eat bread that a Samaritan baked. I mean, th- this is more serious than a lot of football fans. It you is. Know I mean? I it mean, is. I mean, this is rough. Yeah. And uh, and so it's that kind of cultural, uh, that cultural uh, sort of stigma that was existing in the time of Jesus that Jesus is walking into when he walks into Samaria. It also is the reason why on several occasions in the gospel stories, you get Samaritans in the stories of Jesus, you get Samaritans portrayed in a different way because you end up with the good Samaritan Mm -hmm. and you end up with the only leper who thanks Jesus is a Samaritan. And so you end up with you end up with Samaritans portrayed differently because it's trying to draw a, the sort of shine the spotlight on the kingdom of God is different. Yeah, yeah. And it, it can even go to the Samaritans. Right. Which is what Jesus does. And he yes. goes, he shows up in chapter four. He he goes, for some reason, he's in Samaria. Uh the uh disciples are with him. Uh they say, you know, we're, we're hungry, we need some food. They take off. And and while they're gone, this Samaritan woman uh, comes to him. Mm-hmm. Now, what I love about this passage, one of my favorite in the, in the whole Bible, is because everything is wrong with this passage. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, culturally, yeah. everything that could go wrong for, <laughs> from a reader, from a Jewish perspective, uh, is going wrong. So, first of all, they're in Samaria. You, you don't go to Samaria. You don't go to Samaria. But they're there. Ever. And so, yeah, but then... then the disciples leave, and a Samaritan woman comes up, and Jesus begins to talk to her. Now, you weren't supposed to speak to a woman in public or a woman alone, and particularly not a Samaritan woman. Right. And this Samaritan woman, from scriptural reference, has a track record with lots of husbands. Yeah. Not not the you know the greatest reputation. Nope. And and here's Jesus striking up this conversation, and he's also sent the disciples into a Samaritan town to buy food to bring to him a rabbi to eat. Right. And you, you didn't accept anything from a Samaritan, so you wouldn't accept food. No. And, and But furthermore, then Jesus looks at the lady and asks for a gift from a Samaritan. You, you, you didn't accept them, much less ask for no. a, a, a request or, or for, for something from them. And he asked for water. And it starts this very curious conversation where, as we remember Amelia Bedelia, there feels like there's multiple layers going on with the conversation. Yeah, Jesus talks on this plane. Yeah. She hears on this plane. He's talking spiritually. She's talking practically. Right, yeah. right. So she says, you know, I need, he's, I want some water. And, and she says, you're, you're wanting water from me, a Samaritan? And, uh, and she says, uh, you know, I, I, well, what you you pick up on the conversation? Well, yeah, she asked him for he he asked her for water, and then she you know he talks to her about the fact that you know he um, he's going to give her water, and of course her response is very practical. Yeah, you know when he says I'm going to give you living water, and she's like you don't even have, you a, have bucket. a bucket. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I love that. You yeah. know that it's just this wonderful play of spiritual and practical conversations going on. Of, you don't even have a bucket. We don't. How are you going to give me water? Yeah, we have to come and get water. And she had a bucket, uh, but it was an unclean rug right, right. Uh, that that because she had touched it, and it mm-hmm. was in Samaria, and it wasn't ritually clean. So Jesus is asking for this, and and then he starts talking about this living water, how she can have living water, and and she seems to to really get excited about that. Now, right. living water can have a lot of different meanings. Uh, I think Jesus was this spiritual refreshment that mm-hmm. changed your life. That uh, that completely changed you, but it also can mean non-stagnant water, right? Uh, and and then there's this discussion about the well that they're at, and she is at uh, Jacob's well, and it just so happens you have a picture uh, from Jacob's well because today there is a, a there's a church church built over the top of it, right? And and keep you know keep in mind where we're located in Israel. Not far from the church of Jacob's well is the ruins of King Ahab and Jezebel's castle. Oh, and so it's all sort of in this area. And you a lot, go a lot in, of good things going on. A in lot that of good world. things. And you go into the church of Jacob's well and you go down into the basement below the church and um, it is still a, a functioning well. And so they, they take the bucket 
and they lower the bucket way down in the well, and they pull the bucket up. It's a fancy bucket, too. It's a really nice. It's That's genuine galvanized <laughs> right there. Uh, then they take this little cup, and they dip it down in that bucket, and they pass that cup around, and everyone drinks out of it until it's empty, and then they dip it again. And, you know, and I found that if you'll just take it from the person that's handing it to you yeah. and just do like this... <laughs> And hand it to the next person, you don't actually have to drink out of that. Uh, because even pre-COVID, I'm thinking, this isn't yeah, sanitary. Not, this is, this is seem, not yeah. sanitary. It's not going to end well here. No. And so, but this, the, uh, the, the true belief of the uh, Samaritan people is this is the well that was located at the, at the location that's mentioned in Scripture where that Jacob dug, and this is the well that she is at, uh, she comes to and meets Jesus here. Yeah. Now, one of the articles that I read when uh, I was studying on this said that there was lore in the Samaritan uh, theology that said wherever Jacob dug a well, mm -hmm. that the water would go from this stagnant, you got to lower the bucket, to an artesian well right. where there's living water flowing and streaming. And so, uh, so it helps us understand a little bit when she looks at Jesus and says, you know, are you greater than our father Jacob who dug the well? I mean, how are yeah. you going to get living water when, yeah. you know, are you that good mm -hmm. that, that, that you're going to have that uh, result from your being here, that it is going to become a, lo a living, uh, breathing spring of water. Right. And so you've got this two levels of conversation going on. So at the end of the day, um, this lady finally does begin to understand that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus says, you know, you are the, mm -hmm. uh, the Christ. And, she goes and tells all of her friends. They show back up. They become believers in Jesus. And so that brings us back to our ivory soap. Because from a Jewish Levitical law perspective, I lost count of how many times Jesus became unclean in this story. I mean, he started unclean just being in Samaria. Right. And just re and, and remember, unclean is unclean in the eyes of the temple. That he It means he's violated the law, the Mosaic law, the law that's been developed since the Ten Commandments all the way through 613 laws by the time of Jesus. And if you break any of them, violate any of them, then you are considered unclean. And you have to make some amends to the temple in order to be clean again. And it can take weeks to... to Depending to on what it is, it. it can take weeks, right. And so, uh, it, and it wasn't just one thing that Jesus did, mm. but it was over and over and oh, over in again. In this story, it is unbelievable. So Jesus was ceremonially unclean. What's fascinating about the story is that, well, uh, well, this is where we get to ivory. So ivory, 1878, mm -hmm. uh, 99.44% pure, so clean, so pure that it floats. It floats. It just floats. Yeah. And we know by science that anything that floats is, is clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now in my mind, I have pictures of things that are floating, mm -hmm. except they're not clean. They're not clean. They're not clean. They're, they're not. <laughs> no, no, no. And so... It's an odd, so it was a great marketing strategy, right. so clean it floats, but it's, it has nothing to do with purity. Mm. What's fascinating about this is, by the end of the story, it's not so much that Jesus was unclean, but the Samaritan woman and everyone in the town were followers and were clean in the eyes of God. Right. They had been made pure. They had become a part of the kingdom. And so Jesus turns on its head the idea of ceremonially unclean because no longer is it a ritual and no longer is it something that just kind of happens as a part of a, of a, of a, a distant ritual, but it's something that happens inside that we're made clean, we're made pure. We receive this living water that makes us, makes us spiritually alive mm -hmm. and spiritually uh, clean and spiritually um, uh, healthy. And so it's a, it's a fascinating turn of events where it goes from Jesus being the reader going, what is he doing? To going, wow, the power of God is amazing this moment. Yeah, and it does. I mean, it, it's an amazing moment when you see this woman transformed from someone who 
is out there in the middle of the day, so she's out there when she's embarrassed. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to be there when any other woman is there who comes in early in the morning to draw water for their family. She doesn't want to, she doesn't want to associate with them. She's got more wrong in her life probably than she can count, and everyone probably judges her for that, and she encounters the one person who shouldn't be there, but she encounters the one person who looks beyond all of that and he sees the potential within her. And instead of judging her, right. engages her in this conversation of give and take and in an honest conversation it leads to a whole different way of life. Right, and because he does that, she's the one then that's able to go back and make the difference in her village. Yeah. It doesn't say that the disciples who've been in town shopping <laughs> have led all the people there to believe in Christ. Right. And they return horrified because here's Jesus talking to the Samaritan right. woman. Right, they what come back doing? and they're still trapped in, in their yeah. old way of thinking. They got Chick-fil-A yeah. going, Jesus, what are you doing? Come on, <laughs> you know, but the woman's able to go back and make the difference. Yeah. 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 And so we're, I guess it really becomes a model for us uh, when we engage with people, we engage at them at a spiritual level. Mm -hmm looking over and looking past the things that are wrong in life. And like Jesus, just start having a conversation that prayerfully leads to a deeper place for that person. And offers them living water. That's right.